Hi there, I'm Thack. How are you? Welcome to our channel. Recently, I made a video on the Hornet's Needle um, sword from Hollow Knight. And that video was just a five minute splash video, just kind of show the process, no talking, anything like that. This video is to talk a little bit more behind the scenes about the construction and what actually goes into making a sword like this. So, this particular piece, which is big, very large, unwieldy piece of steel. I started with 5160 spring steel is what I wanted to make this out of and I use 5160. I really like that for swords. It's spring steel, like for leaf springs and it's very flexible. It also holds a cutting edge. It's just, it is an ideal steel for swords. So I happen to have some 5160 that was three and a half inches by one inch, I believe. So a pretty big chunk of steel to start with, as you see at the beginning of the video. And I think I cut it off at 32 inches as my starting length. Now I figured as I went through the process, as I started drawing it out, I chopped some off. I believe it was about 21 inches that I used that created this from one end to the other. So that is the amount of material and the weight of that would be 21 by 3 by 1, and I don't know that offhand, but we will put it right here. Magic of video. So let's talk a little bit about the process. So it was a lot of power hammer work, and this is not really a task that you could approach without a power hammer, I think, in any practical sense. It was, it was several hours on the power hammer to forge out that much steel. 5160 as a, a 60 points of carbon is fairly tough steel to move even in smaller quantities, but something that large just took quite a bit of oomph to move it. So you can see in the video how hammering it out, how I drew that out to shape, basically getting the tapering section there and then drawing out the handle. Now, when we started this process, we looked at the game and some of the images of the needle, which was fairly non-distinct. It was, it was, it was a ge geometric shape, which looked quite nice. I liked that shape, but left a lot to the imagination as far as what the details could be. So I took a lot of artistic latitude on this one as far as designing it the way I want. And one of those things was the actual twist in the handle, which I just felt this rope twist, which I really like. It looks really cool, but it also feels good in the hand. And I just thought if you've got bare steel as a handle, that tends to be slippery when you get a sweaty hand on a sword. That's not really an ideal grip. I thought by putting this twist in, which is not a sharp twist, but something that gives a little bit more traction for the hand, just to me, felt like a more realistic or practical grip for this thing. And I think it really lends itself well to it. Also, the eye on the needle, as far as we could tell, tended to be, look more around, but I decided to go with something more like a traditional needle eye shape on it. Just felt that lent itself better to the aesthetic of the piece there. So I took that license there. As we move down into the actual hilt area there, what I did was actually just mushroomed the steel over to create this kind of safety edge in here which I think is a really nice detail, but the idea being is that it just gives your, your hand something to slip up into that you're not getting into danger where the blade actually is there. But I think it makes a very cool aesthetic to it. As we move down the blade, I put a really large fuller in this, and the primary reason for that fuller is to lighten up this blade. Because I knew I had this massive piece of steel, I was trying to bring it down into somewhat of a practical weight and the easiest or the most logical approach to this is to put a fuller in here. So I did on either side here where I did this kind of cathedral cutout here and went quite wide and then tapering the fuller out as far as I could get down there to make this whole thing as light as it possibly can be. This is all made out of one single piece as you can see in the video where I drew this all out, I brought it back on itself and I did a forge weld here, welded that together to create it into one piece there and after that point did my rope twist and tried to blend everything in there to get that um, aesthetic in there. Rest of the forging done on the power hammer, I used my fullering tool, which is just this very clunky looking device here, but basically what that is, is a cylinder shape there. And what that allows me to do is 
when I'm hammering is to spread things wider. On the hammer, a power hammer or even hand hammering, um, steel tends to want to draw out lengthwise as opposed to widthwise. In this case, I was trying to get as much width as possible. So in order to encourage that, I used my fullerene tool here, which just puts force in a longitudinal direction there and helps it to spread wider. So you can see in the video how I'm moving that back and forth in order to spread the piece wider. And that let me get the thing forged into shape. The size and weight of this sword became another logistical issue when I got to the grinding phase. Typically I go to my knife grinder to grind out uh, knives or swords and works quite well and I can do all sorts of things with it. But this one I realized it was just too clunky, unwieldy, too big and too heavy to be able to hold it properly and use that. So I decided to clamp it to the table and use my trusty angle grinder. Over my years as a blacksmith, welder, fabricator, I have spent thousands and thousands of hours with one of these in my hand. So I'm pretty adept at it and I knew I could sculpt this roughly to the shape that I wanted. So I ended up spending seven or eight hours I believe in total, might have been a little bit more than that, just with the angle grinder, just to grind this out to shape, to bring the weight down and to define the edges. Also use that to grind out the fuller. I was able to bring it to this shape, which is at a rough finish. This is not the final finish on this blade by any stretch, but it was able to bring me to the rough finish well enough to go into heat treating. And that is what I'm gonna talk about now. Heat treating. So I decided I was going to make this fully functional sword and heat treat this one. And I have my new heat treating oven, which I recently got and I wanted to uh, give it a run for a, a test run for a sword. I've done se several knives in it, but I haven't done a sword in it. And I got one that was 48 inches long specifically that I could heat treat swords. And then of course my first sword is 64 inches long, so I couldn't even fit the thing in there. So we had to jury rig uh, a, a door opening there, as you can see in the video, to get it um, into place and get it heated up. Anyway, it worked quite well. Heat treating, I'm not gonna go in depth on the whole metallurgy and science of this. I'll just quickly run through some of the steps. Maybe in a future video I'll do that. There's also tons of resources on YouTube on the heat treating specifically, and you can look into that. Just realize it's not, like you see on Forge and Fire where they just do the quench and then it's done. That's only one part, one component of the whole heat treating process. To go through it fairly quickly, the heat treating process involves firstly annealing where you heat the piece up to critical temperature which is 1450 Fahrenheit and leave it at that temperature for a while and then let it cool down slowly over the course of six or seven hours and this relaxes that piece of steel and removes the stresses in it preparing it for the machining and for the rest of the heat treating process. So that's the first step we can do. You can also do heat cycles in there. I won't talk about that. I didn't do that on this particular sword. Um, that's also something that you can do to shrink down the grain size for the steel. Again, a different topic, not for this particular one. After I had the piece all machined, and ready to go, I went to the hardening step, and what that involved was putting it into the heat treating oven, bringing it up to 1450 fairly quickly, um, leaving it at that temperature for a few minutes, and then I pulled it out and quenched it in quenching oil. You see my quenching tank, which was about, I think, seven inches in diameter, and I heated up the oil because I wanted hot oil for this one, which is a faster quench but it's still a fairly gentle quench and you always want to use for something that, like this shape this long and wide you want to use quenching oil as opposed to water or brine or something like that you want a gentle quenching medium and oil provides that so quench the sword um, and when I pulled it out there was some warpage that happened which is to be expected on a blade this wide and this long and then what you can do while it's still hot is do a little bit of bending and bending forks and I started trying to do that to bend it out and it was getting a little cool on the tip and I was getting a little bit too cocky and pushing the envelope and what happened was dun, 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 snap the tip off and cut to a clip of that right now anyway the tip broke off and that was a pretty disappointing moment for me very deflating for my ego but it was a stupid move and I knew better Anyway, what I did at that point was just MIG weld it back into place, ground it so we could finish 
that initial video. I will actually be welding it back again for an upcoming video that we will be doing with the Hornet's mask. And then after that, I'm going to rework the tip to make this into a fully functional sword again. But once something like that has broken off, there's really no going back to repair that. So what I'm doing by welding it on is simply a cosmetic fix for a moment. And that was a uh, slap on the wrist for me. I knew better and I did it anyway. What I should have done and what I did do after that is for the tempering, which is the next step and the very important and critical step in heat treating, when you harden the blade, you make it very hard, but it's brittle. And for a sword, that is what you do not want. You want something that's gonna hold an edge, you need the hardness for that, but the brittleness, you need a sword to be tough, so you need to temper it. And tempering sacrifices some of that hardness, but also the brittleness, to give it the necessary toughness or springiness to make it function as a sword. Back to my heat treating oven. This time, instead of being at 1450, I had it at 550 because I wanted to go for a fairly springy temper on this. So I had it at 550 degrees and ran it at that for two hours. And I did two cycles of that. And what that does is sacrifice some of that hardness to introduce the flexi toughness that we want for that. And that gave me a nice spring temper on my sword. So it's got a spring temper on there, but I didn't grind this thing down fully it's still, I want to do some finish on it, thin that out so that I'll be able to utilize that springiness. Right now my cross section is still fairly thick and fairly stiff, which I wanted to, to get it through the heat treating process. So what we ended up with was a sword 64 inches long and a roughly around 10 pounds, which is really very much on the heavy side. For even for a sword this long, it should be half that weight um, at most. So the thing is a little unwieldy. The reason for that, and they really can't get past it, is the handle is solid steel and three quarter inch round or, or even greater than that. So there, there's no getting around that. There's a lot of weight out here um, and it balances out uh, pretty much at the hilt there. So all this weight is out here, which is unusual for a sword. So the blade itself, I don't think is too far off. Like I said, I still have some material there that I wanna move remove yet and bring that down and bring this to a finer finish than what it is but for all intents and purposes i'm very pleased with how everything came out besides my little breaking off of the tip here which i, I will remedy to as best as i can but i think it worked out quite well and a very successful build I, and i really like the aesthetic of this thing i think it really makes a statement maybe not the most practical sword in a historical sense, but it certainly has a cool look to it. Um, and we want to do an upcoming collaboration video with someone, which we'll talk about soon, um, with the Hornet's Mask, the whole costume and everything like that, and have this in. And we also have a couple other Hollow Knight builds that we're looking at doing in the future as well. So stay tuned for that. Almost forgot, in our previous video, we had a comment. One of uh, our viewers asked us why we didn't temper it, in the way he described it, all the way up there. And quite simply, my quench tank is only 40 in, 48 inches deep, so I could only get up that deep. My oven also is only 48 inches, so I was just getting the blade itself. This part I actually annealed and softened this up and just removed the stresses from it, which should be fine. Based on its thickness and everything like that, I don't think I need to do any actual uh, heat treating or tempering or even on this thing. It's just the fact that I've removed all the stresses from it should be fine for that. We will, in further videos, we'll be doing um, a sword build from start to finish and covering the entire heat treating and everything that goes with that. But stay tuned for that in future videos. Um, also, like I said, we'll be readdressing the nail. I did that in a previous video, but I have people asking for um, different versions of that. And we have some ideas that I'm trying to kick around with some maybe Cable Damascus or something like that. So that is also upcoming. So please subscribe, leave your comments below. Thumbs up, thumbs down, all that sort of thing. And let us know what you'd like to see next. So that is it. See ya.